Hello and welcome to uh, the video on the third chapter of the book, Collective Choice in Social Welfare. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that this chapter contains a deep here, which is, if not the most important, but certainly the most well-known theorem in social choice theory. I think in, if economics had a theory of general relativity, Arrow's impossibility theorem, or Arrow's general possibility theorem, uh, would be it um, because of how many people know it and also how relevant it is. And we will be, in fact, proving it in this chapter. Uh, but before that, let me explain one thing. Right? Before we get into the mathematics, let me explain what the theorem's significance essentially is. So we have seen something called collective choice rules, right? The manner in which or the rule by which we take in individual orderings of social states, right? And associate that with a social ordering R. That is called a collective choice rule. Now, in the 18th century, there was a mathematician called Condorcet. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. It's a French name, I think. Uh, who showed that majority rule could often yield the, the collective choice rule, which is majority choice rule, could yield inconsistent results. Let's see what he showed. Right? He showed that suppose x, p1, y, y, p1, z, right? y, p1, z, z, sorry, this is p2, x. Again, z, p2, x, p3, x, and x, p3, y, right? Suppose we are given this, right? Now, by majority choice, by majority, you see, there are three people. Two people prefer x to y, first and second. So x, p, y should be true. Okay. Again, two people prefer y to z, so y, p, z should be true. And again, two people prefer z to x, so z dx should be true. Clearly, this is intransitive. This is what Condorcet showed, right? But here, he used a general collective choice. He used a specific collective choice rule and showed that it was inconsistency. This in itself was quite a remarkable result, right? And in fact, Lewis Carroll, who we know as the author of Alice in Wonderland also worked in this field. He also showed that there were certain other uh, collective choice rules which would be problematic. Uh, for instance, a collective choice rule where you give now give numbers when a person gets uh, when when a social state gets a certain rank. Anyway, you can read some more of that in the book. There are a few more examples of specific collective choice rules that fail. Kenneth Arrow systematized this entire thing in this theorem, right? And he showed this. First of all, there are two steps to this theorem, right? Steps. Impose five desirable conditions on R, right? So these are conditions you would want R to have. And you will see them in a few minutes, right? And then prove that no collective choice rule satisfies them. Okay. So the leap was as follows. Before Arrow, people were proving that specific collective choice rules, giving counter examples and showing that these rules fail, basic transitivity of completeness. Arrow, first of all, imposed more conditions more than just to uh, R being an order, among other things, he imposed other conditions first. It showed that no CCR can satisfy them, right? So in, a, in short, he saved a lot of social choice theorists at that time, or he said, stop looking for counter examples because no collective choice group can satisfy uh, this con these conditions, right? So let's get into the proof then, right? Now that we have understood what uh, arrows and possibility theorem essentially is and how intellectual power it is, right? Right. So the, let's look at the five conditions, right? 
condition one, right? Okay, it's called condition O. It's the first condition. R should be an ordering, right? So what this is, right? There's a definition here, right? The collective choice rule will be called a social welfare function if this is satisfied, right? This is the definition we use later on. Right? So social welfare function is a collective choice rule F, the range of which is restricted to the set of orderings over X, right? and this is called condition O. The second condition is called U, unrestricted domain. We, I think, discussed a little bit of this before. This means that all our eyes must be in domain, right? So if you remember, we showed how uh, the Pareto relation R bar is incomplete, right? And then we showed that if you impose certain conditions on the individual objects, then it becomes that. That sort of thing cannot be done under this condition u. The next condition is p. It's called Pareto principle. Right? We studied R bar uh, in the last class. This is a slightly weaker version of this. It tells right what is this condition for all x comma y belongs to x. Right? If for all i x p i y is true and x, p, y should be true. Okay. It's called the Pareto condition, or the Pareto principle. I, independence of irrelevant terms. This will take a little bit of explanation. Let me explain it after I uh, uh, tell you condition five. Condition five is, non-dictatorship. Right. This is a, also a very simple condition. It tells you that there is no I such that XPIY implies XPY for all X comma Y. So if there is an individual I such that whenever he prefers any X to Y, Society also, then he becomes naturally a dictator. And this is also a condition. We don't want the collective choice to, uh, to have, right? It's very simple. These are, the, the leap is in the, the intellectual leap is in the fact that these five conditions are so very reasonable. Right? Very, very innocuous, very innocent. You would think that any social choice the, uh, any any collective choice you would want you want you you make would want uh, you would want uh, having these characteristics. Sorry for that uh, slip of tongue, right? Let me explain independence of irrelevant identities. Now the book has a mathematical definition. We will get to it, but let's understand this first. Suppose there is x. Okay, let me let me take a real life example. Let's say there are two candidates, Trump, Biden, right? Let's call this T, let's call this Now, suppose society, by whatever collective choice to, it refers Trump to Biden, okay? Now, suppose, um, let's say Gary Johnson, J, enters the election. Okay. Now, society may prefer Trump to Johnson, Biden to Johnson, they may prefer Johnson to Trump. There could be various orderings. DPB remains the same. 
what does this mean? It means that my preference or society's preference between Trump and Biden should not depend on who else is in the election. This is called the independence of irrelevant alternatives. All right. So let's look at let's look at the mathematical definition given in the book. Let R, this is independence. Let R and R prime be social relations corresponding to Ri and Ri dash. I obviously runs from one to n. Right? Now, if S is a subset of X, for all x comma y belongs to s. If for all x comma y belongs to x, x r i y implies and is implied by x r i prime y. Then choice set of s with respect to r and choice set of s with respect to r dash should be the same. What it means is, so Ri and Ri prime are two different uh, individual sets of individual orders. But for this subset of X, S, right, these individual orderings are the same. Right? Hence, the best elements of these sets should also be the same. Right? So here, essentially, S is equal to Biden Trump. Right? And X may be Biden Trump and Johnson. Right? So, for Ri, Ri and Ri prime may be different on this, but they are the same on this. So, if Ri says they prefer Trump to Biden and Ri prime says they prefer Trump to Biden, the collective choice rule should also say the same vis-a-vis -vis the choice set. Right? So, that extra element and their preferences over that are quite irrelevant, right? So just to draw this out further, suppose Ri says, let's say, I don't know, Trump preferred to Johnson by the second person. But Johnson is, Johnson is preferred to Trump by the second person in Ri prime. This should not change what my best element of S is, right? This is what independence of irrelevant alternatives is. So these are the five conditions which Arrow has imposed on a desirable social welfare function, right? And the theorem says that there is no S social welfare function satisfying these conditions, right? And the proof of this is remarkable. And in a way, for me, it was anticlimactic because the proof doesn't actually involve any clever mathematical maneuver. It is simply going to prove it through some auxiliary definitions. Let's get right into it. So the definition which we use to prove this, a set of individuals, a set of individuals V, V is almost decisive okay, for social state X against Y. Okay, if X, P, I, Y for all I in V and Y, P, I, X for all I not in implies x p y. So if all the individuals in set V prefer x to y and if everybody else prefers y to x, then x then society turns out prefers x to y. That is called almost decisiveness. Right? V will be called the set of individuals V, it could be one individual as well, will be called almost decisive. Right? The second definition is the same, right? V is decisive 
for x against y. My mind you, this is specific to x and y. Right? For some w and z, this may not be true. If x p i y implies x. Okay. So you see, this is denoted by d of x comma y, right? and this is denoted by d bar of x comma y. And the note of importance here is that d bar x comma y implies d of x comma y. I hope everybody agrees. For set, right? So x p i y implies x comma y. Here x p i y. And y p i x, so we can easily incorporate this into full decisiveness as well. Okay, so these are the two definitions. Mind you that set B might be a single to set as well. In which case, uh, at least vis-a-vis -vis x and y, that individual becomes a dictator. Right. Moving on, how to prove this theorem like this? Right, the first lemma to prove was. If there is an individual J, if there is an individual J, right, who is decisive for some X against Y, right, she is Sorry, it will be almost decisive. Who is almost decisive for some x against y? So that's just one pair. She is a dictator. It's a stunning lemma. Stunning, right? It's, it seems totally counterintuitive. There's one pair of alternatives, x and y, and this individual is almost decisive for x against y. She becomes a dictator, right? As we will. Show and we have, of course, already seen what a dictator is. Oh, by the way, of course, this depends on the condition. If uh, O, U, P, e, and I, right? these conditions have to help, of course. And the second lemma is there exists an individual J such that she. Is almost decisive for some x against y. So obviously, from these two lemmas, you have proved arrows and possibility theorem. Because so there exists a J who is almost decisive for some x against y. And then this individual J turns out to be a dictator under these conditions. And so we have proved arrows and possibility theorem. Right? Very counterintuitive. And a remarkable intellectual. Now, let's get into the first level. Okay? This the proof is a little involved. You have to stay with me. So, J is almost decisive for X against Y. Okay. Now, suppose. X, P, J, Y, right? And Y, P, J, Z. Now suppose Y, P, I, X, and Y, P, I, Z. I, I is all individuals who are not J. Okay. Now, from this, what do we get? First of all, x, p, y, right? Because, well, by the definition of almost decisiveness, and y, p, z, this is y, per dito condition, right? Because everybody prefers y, p, z, right? But this implies x, p, z, by condition of, right? This implies dictatorship of J, or sorry, or decisiveness of J of X against or X against Z. How did we make this leap? Note here. From here, let me use a different 
and here we can say x p j z is true. We know nothing about what other individuals feel towards x and y, x and z, but we can say x is z. So here, if you see x p j z has implied x p z. Correct, which obviously makes him uh, makes him decisive for X against Z because we don't know anything about the other those preferences. Okay? That's what the definition of decisiveness is. Okay? Now, of course, we don't know about other people's preferences, so you cannot tell me that. Their preferences of x is of y and y is of z has any effect on the social choice between x and z because that would violate i. Okay. Again, this is not completely intuitive, but nevertheless it should be clear, right? We can assume x is z, right? This without knowing what other people feel, because otherwise they would be violating y. The condition i. Okay. So what have we shown till now? We have shown that almost being decisive for X against Y implies being fully decisive for X against Z. We could use a similar method to show, I will not show it here, but it's pretty easy to prove, that you're also decisive for Z against Y. Okay. Now, This implies, this is full decisiveness, so this also implies almost decisiveness, right? So what does D of X comma Z imply? Can you tell? Almost decisiveness for X against Z. Based on this, right, it implies decisiveness of X against Y. Full decisiveness. Again, Decisiveness of X against Z implies full decisiveness for Y against Z based on this, right? Same proof we could have done, right, for Z. Similarly, decisive for Z against Y implies full decisiveness for Z against X. Again, decisiveness for Z against Y implies full decisiveness for X against Y, which we have already shown, so we don't need it. So not what we are trying to do. Let me tell you what we are trying to do. Okay, let's do a few more pairs. This is, a, again, a remarkable, one of my favorite methods it has to be. Okay. So we started from almost decisiveness for X against Y. From that, we obtained full decisiveness for X against Z, from which we obtained partial decisiveness for X against Z. From this, we obtained these two, right? And again, this implied this, and from here, we obtained this. So note here, let's keep track. We started with this, what all have we got? We've got full decisiveness for X against Y. We've got full decisiveness for X against Z. Z is any alternative. Z is an arbitrary alternative because arbitrary alternative, right? We got decisiveness for Z against Y. We got decisiveness for Y against Z. And we got decis full decisiveness for Z against X. This is one, two. Three, four, five. The last thing which is left to do is to show this decisive, almost decisiveness for y against z, which we can get from here, implies full decisiveness for y against x. So note here, right? what did we do? From here, we come to here. This is the succinct result. What does this tell you? 
it tells you that this individual who was almost decisive for x against y is fully decisive for any pair x, y, and z, any ordering of the pairs, right? So among x, y, and z, you can obviously order it um, in three p two ways, which is six, right? So we start from this and we said that if any, if there's a triple containing x, y, and some other element z, this individual is fully decisive for any pair, right? I hope you see where we are going from this. Right? So having proved this, we are actually almost done with the lemma. Now we'll show that he's a full dictator. Now take the larger set, x. Suppose u and v belong to x. We have to show, we want to show full decisiveness for u against v of this individual. How do we show it? Case one, u is equal to x, v is equal to y. We are done. We have already proved that x is fully decisive against y and y is fully decisive against x. We want to show it both ways. Case two, u is equal to x, v is unequal to y, right? In this case, set v is equal to z in our earlier example that we have done, right? because we have shown full decisiveness for x against z and full decisiveness for z against x. Done. Case three, u unequal to x, v unequal to y. Now, take x, y, and u. Right? From here, we can get this. Replace u with z. It's the same thing. Now, take x, u, and v. We get this. Very simple. Again, replace u with y in our original example and do the whole problem again. We are done. So, for any u and y, the individual is fully decisive for u against v and v against u. We are done with the lemma, right? This is a remarkable lemma, right? So this, this is a bit involved, the proof. You have to, I think, watch this video a few times. You have to read the book a few times before you get it. But uh, by showing you what the intention was, I hope I've been able to make it slightly easier. You know, I've been able to tell you, uh, go behind the scenes and show you what Arrow was trying to prove here, right? And I hope this part was clear. This part is very simple. You have to think about it a couple of times, but it's quite simple. So we have proved lemma one. We will now prove lemma two, right? So we will now prove that there exists some individual J who is almost decisive for some X against Y. When we combine this lemma with the first one, we get the fact that there must exist a dictator under the other form of conditions, right? Lemma two is relatively easy to prove. So, if you see it, now take any pair, any pair you come, right? There exists some decisive set Which is this set, the whole, the set of all individuals, right? Think about this. If I take any pair, there has to be at least one decisive set for that pair. U against V. Almost decisive set for U against V. Um, why? Because the set of all individuals have to be decisive for U against V by the particular principle, right? Now, if there are any number of alternatives, right, as I said, there will be various pairs, right? And each pair will have at least one decisive set. It may have more, right? Compare all these decisive sets. Right? And take the smallest decisive set. Smallest decisive set. 
call it to be. Let it be size this for x against some x against some y. This is the smallest decisive set. We could have all the individuals smaller than all the individuals as well. It's quite irrelevant as we will see the proof. Now divide V will be split into V1, which is just one individual, right? and V2, the rest. And of course, we have V complement, V union, V complement is all individuals, right? Which we call V3. Okay. We have divided now. If cardinality of V was one, we have done. Obviously, then we have a decisive set containing one individual uh, who then becomes a dictator by the one, right? So we suppose that, therefore, we suppose that the cardinality of V is greater than one, right? And hence, we are able to do this division. Therefore, both V1 and V2 are non -indicated. Suppose now, For all i, x, p, i, y, y, z, p, i, x, x, p, i, y, sorry, just a second. For all j, and for all k, in 3, we have y, k, uh, z. First of all, an important clarification. We are able to take such a thing, a counter example, to prove our point because of condition U. So nobody can come here and tell you that you cannot suppose these are the individual differences because then that would violate you and be done. Right? Now, from these preferences, x, p, y is true. Why? Because v is almost decisive for x against y, right? And everybody in v prefers x to y, while everybody not in v prefers y to x, right? You can show from here by transitivity. So this must be true. Similarly, if you see, um, Z, P, Y cannot be true. Sorry, Y, P, Z has to be true. Right? Sorry. Z, P, Y cannot be true. Why is this? Right? Because Y, P, I, Z for <clears throat> the individual in V1. And y p k z for the individuals in v three. So z p y only is for individuals in v two. Okay. So if z p y were true, that would make that would make v two an almost decisive set for z against y. But v two is smaller than v. And we have already said that v is the smallest almost decisive set, right? So this cannot be true, and hence this has to be true, right? Now, since R is, com uh, R is complete by condition O, this has to include this. But X, P, Y, Y, R, Z imply X, P, Z. But this makes P1 almost decisive. For x against z, which cannot be true since again, yes, you is the smallest subset. So the one which is smaller than cannot be a subset. So we have a contradiction which can only be resolved if we cannot be split into two subsets, right? That is, if it contains just one. Division.
schedule. And so we have proved the level and we have done. We have proved that there exists at least one individual who will be the set containing one individual single set, who is almost decisive for some x. Then combining lemma two and lemma one, we are done. Right? 